Hi, you're listening to FreethinkRadio.com. It's May 25th, 2011. Um, we're going to be joined with Dan Dix from Press for Truth and Into the Fire very shortly. Um, again, you're listening to Lifting the Veil, and this is Carrie Lee. Now, um, I'm just going to give you a quick rundown of... Uh, I, did, I never went... Um, I couldn't, we couldn't find sitters for the kids and I was not taking my kids into that situation. But, um, we have, I have a very good friend of mine that lives in Toronto and I'm just going to give you a little bit of his story, which is nothing compared to what you see in Into the Fire, but still it's absolutely ridiculous. Um, now my friend is a video editor in Toronto and he uh, he decided that he was going to go down and take pictures. His words saying, you know, how many times are you going to see this in Toronto? Um, so he went down on his bike, and he went to take pictures of a wheel by a fence, which, I mean, to anybody else, it's, it's a wheel on a fence, right? Um, he crouched down, wanted to take a macro shot of, of this, and I'm going to grab that picture right now so that I can post that for anybody who hasn't seen it. Um, He's really creative, good guy, does a great job as far as uh, photography, and he's a film editor. Um, so here's the picture of what he took. Now, no one would ever think, ever, that something like this would garner police harassment. And I don't know what else to call it other than that, because he was harassed at that point. Um, there were about six police officers all huddled in a row, and, you know, it was two day. it was the 19th of June of last year, and he, uh, so this female cop comes up and says, you know, what are you doing? And he's like, I'm taking pictures, because what is he doing? He's taking pictures. And he said maybe that um, he was a little caught off guard and whatnot, and she turned around and she said, well, just so you know, we turned around and we hauled somebody off about an hour ago for doing the same thing, so you might not want to be doing that. And he's like, but all I'm doing is taking a picture of a wheel next to the fence. And she said, well, you don't want to be doing that, basically. <clears throat> he, they couldn't understand why he was taking a picture of the fence. He said he was completely caught off guard, and he was threatened with being taken to prison over a ridiculous picture. Um, he ended up driving off not too long afterwards and uh, taking a fantastic picture that I'm going to have to somehow upload of Union Station with, uh, I mean, it's very ominous looking. He's got real talent for editing the picture afterwards. Now, this is not something that Canadians are used to by any means at all whatsoever. This is not something that we think is normal. Any, I mean, I know I told some people, friends of mine, this, and they were like, no, there's no way. The cops wouldn't do that. We live in a free country. Well... As Dan Dix put into his, his film, Into the Fire, you will see that on that day, it was clearly not Canada. We were clearly not living in a free area, a free country, and our rights were taken away from us. Uh, Dan, are you there? I am. Welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks, uh, thanks so much for having me on. Fantastic. Um, we're really happy to have you. Um, so... What do you what do you say to the to my friend that was taking pictures and gets you know like I said harassed for just taking a picture a macro picture at that of a wheel and a piece of fence? Yeah, I just caught a bit of the end of that. Um, yeah, I mean those are a lot of the things that we started seeing in the city leading up to uh, the summit weekend basically, and those were all the. The kind of warning signs, I guess you could call it, that um, the police state was being ramped up. Uh, we started noticing things like that even even as far up as about two, three months before the actual summit. Um, even private security uh, were on the alert and, you know, they were just keeping an eye out for every little thing and, and anything and everything was suspicious uh, at, that, at that point. Even, like you said, taking a picture of a building, or uh, even for filming downtown, I mean, we got stopped a lot of times for filming because we were basically surrounded by banks. And, uh, I, you know, people may have seen some of those clips where security guards come out and they say, guys, you can't film. Uh, you can't point the cameras at the buildings. And, uh, yeah, that was just a sign of, of some of the, the brutal things that were to come uh, on that on that weekend. 
Yeah, for sure. Um, now, you did a fantastic job. I bought the DVD. I'm not going to give away any of the uh, extras because it's just completely worth it to buy the DVD to get it. Anybody that's watched it online, um, I, I ask that you help support Press for Truth. They're out there doing stuff that not a lot of people are doing, getting the information out there to us so that we can see things from an un- unbiased standpoint and Dan for that I credit you and I thank you because you're doing something huge for the truth community um, the people that want to see exactly what's going on um, from an unbiased, uh, unbiased stance and like I said for that thank you very much oh well thank you very much uh, you know we, we really appreciate uh, the support and um, yeah like you said with the uh, with the DVD uh, we do have some pretty cool special features on there that I'm uh, that I'm happy with and excited about so um, yeah, we're just happy to get the information out, you know, and that's why we we put it all out there for free. Uh, we, you know, at this point, we just need to continue to raise awareness and uh, basically make Canadians aware of some of these things that are going on because they're they're simply not getting this info from the mainstream media. And you know, we're in a time where people are. I mean, I mean there's some massive awakening happening. People are hungry for this information. And they feel that they're getting lied to, and they're beginning to look to alternative sources for their information. And uh, I suppose that's where we come in. That's where shows like this come in. That's why this kind of stuff is very important, uh, because people want this info, and rightly so. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm definitely happy to, uh, to be involved. Yeah, and we're happy to have you. Now, I have to ask, are there points where you sit back and go, oh, I'm kind of nervous right now? <laughs> I don't know if I want to be here in this situation. Maybe I should back off a little bit. Or do you just go full tilt? Uh, I go full, full tilt, but, I, 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 you know, I have those times for sure. I mean, you know, I, I think everybody does. In, in whatever kind of uh, career path you might choose, you might doubt yourself sometimes. You might question yourself. And, yeah, sure, I, I do sometimes when I get nervous about certain things. But over time, I've learned that often when I get those feelings and uh, I feel a little bit nervous or I'm not too sure, um, that is usually when good things are happening. And now I recognize it as, as a sign that I'm doing something that may turn into something big or I'm doing something that is important and needs to be done. So now when I get these nervous feelings or whatever, you know, I, I just uh, kind of shrug it off and I, and I trust that everything's going to be okay. Like when I confront certain people, you know, politicians and stuff, and often I'll do it in, in a room full of four, five, six hundred people, and uh, yeah, I get super nervous, you know, I, I walk into the room and I'm like, oh my god, I don't want to do this, uh, I, I don't want to do this anymore, but um, but you know what, it, it, it just needs to be done, and you, you, just, you just find a way, and I, I think I'm getting better at it over time, but certainly I get nervous at times. Yeah, for sure, I can understand that, I was a little ball of nerves before you got on the show. <laughs> um, now, okay, let's talk about the movie a bit. Now, in the film, I had I've had a bombardment of questions from people saying, "Can you ask Dan this? Can you ask Dan that? Can you ask Dan?" And, and some of it, I'm gonna definitely get into. <clears throat> One of the questions: um, a lot of people aren't exactly sure how the role of journalist comes into play, and that there are like some there's a moral integrity, journalistic integrity that that goes along with it all. Now, um, you had explained, this doesn't really go with that just yet, but you explained in another interview that I happened to watch um, how you acquired the um, tapings of Charlie Veach and whatnot. Would you do me a favor and explain that to the audience here? Because some of them, I'm sure, haven't, they don't understand that there's a process you can go through to get the information that you need if you've been filmed by the police. Sure, yeah, the process here in Canada is referred to as the Access to Information Act request. Now, anybody can file this. You can file it with any agency that may have footage of you or pictures of you. Uh, You can file it with the Toronto Police, with the RCMP, with the OPP, uh, whoever you think uh, may have footage of you, and they are legally obliged uh, to respond to that request within 30 days. Now, there are a number of things uh, that go along with it. Um, there's privacy rights uh, concerns. Um, so if there's anybody else in the photos or the video, they won't uh, release it to you to protect that other person's privacy. And that's why we were able to obtain the footage of Charlie, um, because he was the only one in the cell at that time. Had there been anybody else in that cell, uh, we wouldn't have been allowed 
uh, to ever see uh, the footage. Um, but right. I mean, so bear in mind, like there there was upwards of thirty to forty guys in those cages at times. So you know, it's great that we gave a glimpse into what it looked like inside of there and through that footage. But uh, really, it, it doesn't even do it justice to to you know to the point that. I mean, there was 30 to 40 guys in those cages. So, um, yeah. but anyways, yeah, that's how we got it. We filled the Access to Information Act request, and uh, they gave us 19 hours of Charlie's uh, footage. And it was actually an interesting process to even work with the footage because it's not editable. Uh, it, it comes in a codec that it that you just can't edit with. And after we we did a little bit of research, we realized, well, that makes sense. I mean. Uh, Police have to do that, otherwise people could tamper with um, with evidence. Um, so we we had to play the tapes off of uh, the monitor and set up a tripod and film the monitor and then capture all 19 hours of that and then uh, play it back that way. So it was a little tricky, but um, so yeah. Anyways, to answer the question, it's 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 called the Access to Information Act request, and anybody can do this, and uh, that's how we got it, and we got it just in the nick of time. We had set a deadline for this date, uh, for, for this film, and uh, we ended up getting the footage just in the nick of time, so it, it, it all worked out. Excellent. That's fantastic. Now, now along those lines at the same time, um, how was your experience with Charlie? Because, I mean, we, I, I personally, I'll go from what I see. I see him as just being this incredibly real human being, just uh, genuine. Uh, he says he wears his heart right there out on his sleeve. I mean, I, I don't, I don't. I just, I think he's fantastic. I think he's a great example. Um, how, how is your uh, interaction with him? I mean, we saw a little bit and, uh, and whatnot in the film, but just your overall thoughts. Yeah, it was great. I think he nailed it. He wears his heart on his sleeve. He's very real. He's, um, uh, he, he's, he's a very, very nice guy. Uh, we, we all just enjoyed our time with him here. He's very uh, charismatic, and he's very funny, and he's very, very positive and upbeat. And, um, you know, it, it was just it was just a lot of fun to to just hang out with them for the weekend. And, uh, you know, we we just walked around all over the city, clowning around, joking around. It was it was good times, really, uh, until everything got crazy when he got arrested there at Union Station. I remember at the time uh, me and Steve were filming him and uh, we weren't sure what to do. They They grabbed him and took him in there. And we were, you know, we were like, should we wait out front? Should we go do something? And we stood around for a couple hours and realized, you know what, they may have him overnight. Who knows? Uh, so we decided to get back to my place as quick as we could and start editing the video. And uh, we just put it up on YouTube as quick as we could to show people uh, what was happening. And, and that was our pretty much our main goal for that weekend with Charlie was to go around, document uh, everything that was going on, get the footage, and put it out on the Internet uh, as soon as possible so that we can keep Canadians informed because people wanted to know what was going on, and um, we just tried our best to provide the info. We did a great job. I mean, it was it was out there right away. We were all privy to it. We saw what was going on, and it was it was just it was horrifying. And at the same time, it was like, well, yeah, of course this is going on. Of course it's gone this far. Of course they're going to make an example out of Charlie, him and his megaphone out there telling people that he's working for the undercover government, right? It was yeah, fantastic. I mean, that's, that's all just start, uh, Charlie's style of, of activism is um, incorporating a sense of humor into it. And I think that's important uh, in, in the movement at times. Um, to have somebody, you know, a guy like Charlie who uses satire in the way he does. But but he still gets his points across and uh, he makes people think. And, um, you know, the people who we are trying to uh, wake up, I guess you can call it, are uh, the people that he, he often um, reaches out to and they, they, they often listen to him. So I, I think it works. Yeah, definitely, for sure. Now, there's been... Um uh, when uh, I'm going to tell you, when I watched into the fire, the whole thing, I didn't. We, my husband and I, didn't finish it till about one o'clock in the morning, and I didn't fall asleep until between three and four. Mm. You know, it was one thing to sit there and watch all these little bits and pieces on YouTube, but when you put it all together, yeah, you can't ignore it, and it it really it's uh, it's very unsettling. It's mm -hmm. um, 
I, I don't like to use fear, but there's there's fear there. There's a, what is this country coming to kind of type thing. And I mean, we you know with my understanding of uh, Bill C three six and whatnot, I, it's just it, it's a show of what's coming more or less. And that's yeah. something that I don't think anybody wants. But there's you know a great amount of the population that's just completely asleep to it, and they have no idea that you know. Especially I live in this little dinky town that that's a lakeside town, absolutely. You know, quaint, I love it here, but we don't have a clue in this town what's going on, really. You know what I mean? It's it's a small town mentality. You don't get that kind of, we're a fair trade city, yes, but, you know, there's, your movie has been able to reach people on a level that nobody really understood because, like I said, we got the media on the television telling us what's going on, and you were able to see and capture that the People dressed up as the black bloc or who were the black bloc were running behind police lines for protection. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, just to, to go back to, to cover what you mentioned earlier, I mean, it certainly wasn't my intention for um, people to leave the film uh, feeling uh, any kind of anger towards the police or anything like that. But, I mean, that, that a lot of the feedback that I'm getting is just that. And it, I suppose it's understandable. I mean, it, the footage speaks for itself. Definitely. So I, I'm, I'm not trying to portray the police in a bad light, but what ended up happening is the police portrayed the police in a bad light because this, the footage speaks for yourself. And when you watch the film, you're, you're basically witnessing uh, the, the really, the really uh, terrible, terrible things that happened here. And we really, really need to, people need to see it so that they can take the proper actions to make sure it never happens again. Okay, definitely. I, you know, when you see something like, you know, a man's prosthetic leg is taken from him and he's old and he can't hobble and yet he's told to and then they drag him, um, something like that is something you would never think that a peace officer would do. Exactly. That's, that's not something that you're thinking, you know, or the guy who says to the two female cops, you know, good luck on, uh, on with Saturday. He didn't, there was no way that he meant it in a sarcastic way or that he was a terrorist, but look at what they did to him. It's, um, there seems to be an awful lot of ego that's running at play here. And, and I know that not, I, I'm sure, and I've heard you say that the police have, there's been some of them that have had a huge rude awakening as to what they were told was they thought they were doing what they were doing was right and now looking back on it they don't feel that way so there's almost a division there now within the ranks yeah yeah absolutely and i think that's a big part of what this g20 is is all about is you know i, I often refer to it as the traveling circus of tyranny because that's really what they are they go around uh, to cities every year and not only to condition uh, the people and to show their brute power and to control everybody and to get that clash that, that they're looking for, but it's also to condition um, the police and to, to um, basically train them uh, all around the world, different police forces, on how to uh, carry out these, these orders. Um, so that's, that's a big part of it. And I think, yeah, a lot of the police are, are uh, waking up to that because – um, you know, they were lied to as well, and uh, a lot of them don't feel right about it, and, and rightly so. So uh, yeah. hopefully some other police officers, like, I mean, there's there's one coming up in France, and there's another one in Mexico. Um, so hopefully people will see this film and can realize, you know, they, they, they need to question their orders. Uh, yeah. You know, definitely need to question their orders. Well, okay, now here's the thing. You can't control what the police are doing, but I'm just going to – myself in this situation i have a big mouth and i can completely attest to that and and i'm okay with that it's one of my faults and my greatest <laughs> triumphs at the same time now if i were in one of these if i was at the rallies i know that i would have opened my mouth if i was stuck in a cage i know i would have said something that would have garnered some of the responses that the other girls got i don't know if any of the listeners know but there were women that were threatened with gang rape if they didn't be quiet or fall into line while they were stuck in these prison cages. Um, I don't I don't know how they thought that they could get away with any of this. But somebody like like me and like all of us that are so filled with passion to try and get the knowledge out there and to protest. I mean, as much as there's people out there that say, you know, protesting doesn't do anything on a government platform because it's corrupt and yada, 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 whatever. OK, fine. And I can I can see the side of that. 
But for people that are still going to these protests and trying to get their voices heard and trying to make a difference, what is the next step for them when things like this happens? When you see the black bloc running rampant, making a mess and running amok, and then the next day while you're sitting and peacefully singing Kumbaya or O Canada or whatever the case is, and the, the police start swarming, what is it that, do you have any thought or idea of what it is that we can do to not fight back but to resist? Well, one of the greatest ways, and I think that we're seeing it increase exponentially all over the world, uh, wherever any massive protest is, is happening, the protesters are more and more now realizing the importance of documentation, and uh, video cameras is one of the, the best ways to do that. And it is extremely important, and, you know, if, if you as a protester want to take it up to the next level, um, I would suggest getting yourself a camera. Uh, that's that's number one. And, um, you know, starting to, to show up to these things with a camera. A lot of times you may not, I mean, so many times I'll just bring a camera to something not thinking much of it or that anything might even come out of it and crazy stuff ends up happening and I'm really, really glad that I brought the camera. That that has happened to me a lot. So that, that's, uh, that's one of the things that I think people need to... Uh, to do more so if they can of course you know and nowadays i mean there's cameras on phones and almost almost everybody has a camera anyways so we're yeah. you know it's working out in that sense okay now um have you had the opportunity to talk to any police officers that may have watched the film or done any talks with any of the police officers since this has happened I briefly chatted uh with some officers but a lot of them don't give me a whole lot of uh of a response, maybe they're, I don't know, maybe if they're not allowed to, maybe if I saw them in a different setting, like when they're not wearing their uniform and we were sitting in a, a bar or something, they would open up and talk a little bit more. Uh, mm -hmm. But so far, uh, I just get a lot of them saying, yeah, I've seen it, yeah, yeah, I've seen it. And uh, sometimes, you know, I'll say, well, what do you think? And, uh, you know, the, the answer is sometimes a lot of, uh, well, you, you know, you do what you do. and um, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay, well, you know, that's fair enough. I mean, they have to, I, they've kind of sworn an oath to each other, right? That's the way that they're looking at it. I don't, I mean, I'm not saying I agree with it, but um, they're going to stick together for the most part. And you're probably right if you were sitting in a bar with them having a conversation kind of off the record without the uniform on. Um, it would be, There's a good chance that it might be um, a different story. Now, yeah, the whole, I, oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, like, I had officers during the actual uh, weekend I mean, we were doing coverage months before, so they all kind of already knew who I was. And there was a lot of times where, to my surprise, uh, I'd have officers recognizing me, but in a very uh, positive and exciting way. Like, they would say, hey, you're you're that guy, and they'd give me high fives. That happened a number of times, probably out of the, I don't know, 20 or 30 times that I got recognized by police, um, maybe four or five of them uh, were shaking my hand and giving me high fives and stuff. Uh, but, the, you know, that was that was during the actual summit weekend. Um, right. So that's interesting. That That is definitely interesting. It's not something that I expected to hear, actually. That's good. Now, um, as far as uh, I lost my thought, um, as far as this goes with the G20, now you have uh, it coming up in France. There's it, there's almost that ominous cloud around it that suggests that it's going to be amped up even more so, especially after what went on in uh, with the royal wedding, with the pre the uh, the pre arrests for crimes that might be committed. What are your thoughts on that? On on the on the, the pre arrests and, and how things are becoming more locked down, and that they're they're doing preemptive strikes on people that have not committed a crime. Well, again, yeah, it's it's more signs that, that the police state is being ramped up. And the way that they always achieve these kind of uh, changes uh, in the system is always incrementally. So anytime we see any of these small, and, and, you know, some might say this is a large step, which to an extent it is, but these are all kind of incremental steps that are leading towards one big massive police state. And we need to continue to recognize them as, as they come along and uh, and fight them when we can. When Charlie got arrested uh, in his pre-arrest crime, there um, again, fit filming it was <laughs> was was great. He ended up getting like 140,000 views, and he he, he uh, exposed to the world what was happening over there in London. 
Um, Definitely. Yeah. Did you happen to see the one with the um, professor that got uh, arrested? They were going. They were going to be doing street theater. No. They arrested him, and he was in. I'm going to say an older gentleman in his sixties, but he was a professor at one of the unis, and uh, they arrested him. And his, if I'm not mistaken, his partner and several of the other people that were going to be um, uh, participating in in the street theater, and uh, he said right out loud, "This is the, this is a joke. You're making a mockery out of yourselves. You're making a mockery out of the entire situation." And uh, that would be that would be the um, the truth of the matter. But I mean, it, arresting a street theater performer is is just I mean, it's just as ridiculous as taking away. I mean, uh, th- it, there's a difference in it, but it's just as ridiculous as taking a prosthetic leg away from a man and asking him to hop. W- where, where is their sense of compassion? Where is their idea of, of right and wrong anymore? Everybody's just guilty until proven innocent. Now, back to the idea of um, the pre-arrest and the idea of, uh, I don't know. What do you think? What do you think about the idea of because we are, as much as we'd like to say that we're not tied to to monar- uh, the monarchy at all? What do you think of the idea of the way that Britain's handling things, the way that the United States is handling things, um, and how it's going to affect uh, affect us in the near future with, say, the NAU? Well, any thoughts yeah, on that? People do have to remember. Yes, we we. We are a, a constitutional monarchy, and um, there are major, major things um, happening uh, in the world today. And like you said, one, one of the one of the bigger uh, agendas that they are all kind of working on bringing together is the North American Union agenda. Um, and just for some of the listeners, in case they're not familiar with that, it's the concept of Canada, the U.S., and Mexico. Uh, all joining together into a union, and you can you, you can basically use the European Union as a as a blueprint to to see what kind of things that uh, are going to be happening over here, or that they're going to be trying to do uh, over here. So yeah, the NAU is something that we really have to um, continue to expose, mm-hmm. and that's why we made our you know our previous film was United We Fall, which we we document that in great great detail. I mean, we interviewed a lot of the the major guys, Bilderberg members, Trilateral Commission members, Council on Foreign Relations guys, top politicians, and and, uh, we got it right from the horse's mouth. And um, we we felt that we were fair, and uh, we gave them, you know, their opportunity uh, to explain themselves. Um, But uh, the movie, you know, we we called it Three Nations, Two Sides, One Union, and the two sides are, are... people who are pro NAU and then people who are against the NAU, uh, some local activists from around here and such. Um, so that's what we focused on that film and also the film before that, actually, uh, The Nation's Deathbed, which was about the same topic. Another incremental step towards the NAU, which was the Security and Prosperity Partnership and the whole protest that happened in Montebello, Quebec. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, so so we're, we we're, we we've been covering uh, those topics in uh, in the films for sure. Now, what are your thoughts on the monarchy in Canada? Do you think that uh, it just just your personal opinion? Are are you, do you are you on the line that the monarchy is, should stay or that we should be free from from the from the idea? I'm, no, this is just me curiosity. I I can't help it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I. I I don't know. I mean, I've been looking into that a lot. Obviously, I think if we we should probably be free from it. I mean, it, 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 anytime one one person is in control, say all the Commonwealths, I mean, that is an obvious uh, sign of uh, of of a problem there uh, to me. Um, I, w- I agree. Yeah. So I see a lot. Well, there's there's some people that are sitting there thinking that the Queen's going to save us from all the bad stuff, and um, I think that. The idea is kind of ridiculous when you think of the uh, the fact that she's kind of got her hands in all the pots to begin with, so there won't be any saving going on. Yeah, no, I, I don't I don't think so either. Um, do you want to do me a favor and give a little plug for the station? Uh, yeah, yeah, you're uh, you're listening to Free Think Radio right now. Uh, Freethink uh, dot com. That is that is it, right? Freethink Freethink Radio dot com. Yep, this is Freethink Radio dot com. 
awesome. And you're listening to Dan Dix. We're so glad to have you on, Dan. Now, um, as far as uh, what's coming up next with the the anniversary of the G20, what what are your plans that way? Um, well, we, we've been tossing around the idea of um, just throwing a free uh, screening, just, just a, an event uh, where people can come, um, people who haven't seen the film, maybe people who have, and check it out and um, just kind of have a little meet and greet. Um, but that, that hasn't been officially finalized yet, but we're going we're gonna to be, um, uh, p- you know, putting out some info about that very, very soon because obviously it's coming up, uh, it's coming up quickly. And um, just something I wanted to, to, to make sure that I, that I said um, just about the film um, before I forget is just, you know, we had hundreds and hundreds of hours of footage uh, that we went through. It was such a daunting task at first. I remember, you know, even just watching it all. We had, I think I personally had about 75 pages of notes front and back with time codes of every single little thing that happened. And uh, it was a huge process at first. And, you know, we filmed, we probably shot about 75% or so of what you see in the film. But mm-hmm. everything else um, was given to us by the awesome people of Toronto. And I just want to give a huge shout out to all the people who provided us footage. And I was contacted by a lot of people who said, you know, I, Dan, I got this footage. Uh, I think you really need to see it. I'm not so sure what I could possibly do with it, but I trust you, I like your work, and I want to give it to you. Please take my footage. And we had tapes showing up, discs showing up, the, you know, uh, USB keys, and lots of footage showing up that, that we went through. And uh, that's really what made this film um, the, the best that it could be, is that the, the, the incredible uh, people of Toronto all joined together and, and helped helped us out and and provided us with their footage and I just want to I just want to thank everybody uh, who who has been involved in the film in that capacity because we we couldn't have made it um, the way it is without you guys so a big thank you to to everybody out there who uh, contributed um, to the film by by sending me your footage um, the the film the film turned out the way it is because of you guys so a big thank you. That's fantastic, and and you're right. Everybody got together and uh, wanted to make this work, right? They wanted to get the truth out there, and when you got enough people working together, um, the results are going to be just that much more fantastic. And and what you see in Into the Fire, um, like I said, it's fantastic. It's 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 a bit shocking. Um, I know that I have given the movie to several people to watch, and they've just went. When did this happen? When did it, when did Canada become this? Can, we're we're under the impression that um, you know we're such a peaceful, loving, free country and 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 whatnot that uh, that we are not a part of this or a lot of the stuff that the Americans go through. Even even we're living in a in a kind of fantasy world where we think that um, we're a, not above it all, but above it all from happening to us. Yeah. Yeah, well, I often think that in the eyes of the global elite, um, we Canadians have uh, have had it pretty pretty easy, and we've been chilling out up here uh, for far too long, as far as they're concerned, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the times, you know, the way they flip that around is uh, this order out of chaos theory or problem reaction solution. I mean, America, you know, they had their their 9-11, you know, London had their 7-7, um, there's economic crashes, there are things, uh, health crises, things happening all over the world, and um, the elite know that Canadians haven't really had uh, much of that uh, until last summer, and yeah. I, I suppose if there's anything good that did come out of the G20, and it is that regular uh, Canadians who, are, who aren't into this info are starting to become aware, and they're they're, they're questioning things now. And because of what they witnessed on YouTube and on, on the news, they're saying, man, this, something about this feels very, very wrong. And um, so I suppose there, there was one good thing that came out of the G20 summit is that it's, it's w- awoken a lot of Canadians to, to, the, to the true state of where we're at here in Canada. Definitely. I, I remember um, talking about it with my mother-in-law, and she said to me, well, what a bunch of idiots for going out to protest in the first place. <laughs> and I looked at her and I was like, wow, what are you talking about, lady? 
And then we um, we shared with her into the fire, and she couldn't sit through the whole thing. She just couldn't do it. Mm-hmm. And uh, and she, and I and but she got enough to see that there she, the the agent provocateurs will call them right. She got to see that bit of it. And then she looked and she said, you know, thank God you guys didn't go. And we were like, but we wanted to. You don't understand how badly we wanted to be there to to show our support, to um to do whatever it it you know that we could have done. Um. But we couldn't. She's like, well, you guys would have ended up in jail. Well, then that would have been a price that we would have paid to get a little closer to the truth, I would say. Yeah. Um, That's the way that I look at it. I've heard a similar response um, from other people uh, talking to uh, about this to their parents. I've heard that from from a number of people now who have said the same thing. They said, you know, my mom said you shouldn't have been there in the first place. And, um, yeah, that's that's the point that needs to be addressed because – you know that's kind of that that it's kind of ridiculous to to say uh, something like that and like you said maybe maybe when when she saw the footage she was like oh i i get it now um you know it's it's important to be to be a part of this thing because there are massive changes taking place right now and um yeah uh, those of us in in the truth movement uh you know you can only do so much research and and read so many books and watch so many documentaries until you get to the point where you want to get active. You want to. You want to get out there. You want to get out on the streets, and you want to start meeting like-minded people. You want to try to expose the things that you are seeing happening, and you start. You start doing that in in any way you can. And a lot of times, it begins with uh, joining up with like-minded people on, say, a meetup group or something, uh, or on Facebook groups, and then getting out in the street and meeting these people and starting to network with like-minded people. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I woke up. In, in 1998, so I, I've been doing this quite a while. I've researched things for many, many years and then started getting active in around 2002, 2003. I started joining a lot of groups and basically having meetings with people and discussing how we can defeat the New World Order, basically. Yeah. But in my experience over the years, uh, it's, it's hard sometimes to, to work with uh, certain people in the movement. People have different objectives. People have different viewpoints, different beliefs. And um, I've worked with so many different people, and it often um, it, it doesn't really – nothing ever gets accomplished. So I got to the point where, where I realized I'm just going to do this myself. I'm going to start my own thing, and I'm just going to do my own thing. And if people want to listen, if people want to watch, great. Um, but yeah. that's all I can do, and I – I started realizing if I want to chip away, chip away at this pyramid pyramid system, this you know the chip away at the bricks in the system, I'm gonna have to do it uh, my, myself. Now, I, I mean, I'm not saying like I, I I work with people all the time, and of course we need solidarity within the movement. We do need to stick together, um, but it's important to uh, to find your own way in the movement as well, and and just be true to yourself and do what you think is right. Well, I completely agree with that, and I commend you for saying that, because the idea is that, you know, there's too many belief systems, and everybody's truth kind of goes, takes them down a different path, right? But the idea that we can't all agree should be something that we should be, we should be able to step away from, because the things that we can't agree with are very personal things, I find. And if people could step away and say, you know what, I don't exactly agree with you, but we agree on many of the other fundamentals, so let's deal with that. But they get to people tend to get too impassioned and believe that their way is the only way in their personal belief. So they dictate to everybody else from that point on, which is very unfortunate. And and I have to agree with you when you say that um, you had to go it on your own. That was one of the most brilliant things that you could have done because you went in with the right uh, the right intention. People are going to start coming to you to share with you. Mm-hmm. And then, and which is exactly what's happened, and which is it, why you're at where you are now, because you made that step, you, you took that step forward, and realized that this is something that you had to take kind of a leadership role for yourself, not for anybody else necessarily, but for yourself, and then let everything follow. Correct? Exactly. Some extent, yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yep. Now, um, I have a, I, you did um, the Harper thing before election. I'm going to post it in chat here for everybody. For anybody who, that hasn't seen this, uh, Dan was given some, well, actually, Dan, you go ahead and I'll let you explain to people what it is that I'm talking about with the Press for Truth exclusive of Here's Your Harper. 
Uh, well, uh, you're talking about some footage um, that I obtained um, not too long before the election, and um, I had this, and I decided to release it. Uh, I thought about it, and I thought, you know what, this is something that I feel that people should have the right to see. It was given to me, and um, I just did what I thought was right at the time, which was to uh, make it public. Uh, and that's that's uh, that's what I did. Now, if, for those who haven't seen it, as I said, I just posted it, and uh, basically Harper's sitting there and backtracking and trying to figure out his words and and messing up, and nothing comes off naturally. Everything's scripted, and he's not very um. He's not very eloquent. Eloquent with his words, we'll just say it that. When you, way. when you speak from the heart, and when you have truth in your heart, you, you don't you don't stumble. You don't need cue cards. You don't need people to. You don't need multiple takes um, when when you're speaking truth from the heart. And uh, that's one of the things that I think people recognize there. Yeah, definitely. Um, the other thing, and I've gotten a few comments to this, so I'm going to address it. Well, um, I took journalism. Not that it really matters, but I did. So I kind of understand, I, I understand quite a bit about in, in journalistic integrity. When someone gives you a piece of information and they ask you to, to not reveal the source, the reason for that is because, first of all, you're putting them in danger if you do. And second of all, no one is, is ever going to give you any other information after that. So anybody who's asking... Dan, to reveal his source for this is is not thinking um, past the idea that someone's life might be in danger for exposing it and that, you know, all this good work that Dan's doing, who's going to trust him to give him any information to that um, extent again? Is that fair to say? That's very, yeah, that's that's very fair. You, you nailed it right there. Um, I simply can't discuss these things, but especially on, on, on Facebook, and I can't engage with these kind of things. And it's to protect uh, the source. Uh, this mm -hmm. person could potentially get into a lot of trouble. And like you said, it's also, I mean, who in the right mind would ever want to leak any kind of information to me if they thought I might mention their name on a radio show or mention their name on my Facebook wall? Um, so... I, I mean, I, I, I was honored to receive it, and, uh, you know, I want people to be able to think that um, if they have something, uh, they, they, can, they can give it to me. Um, okay. So as a journalist, yeah, I'm, I, I, that's why I stated it in the beginning of the video. I'm going to, I'm going to stick to uh, my journalistic integrity and not reveal the source. Yeah, it was, and some people see a conspiracy behind it, and, and I can understand we're living in a time where... It's scary out there. You know, nobody knows who to trust. And I don't mean to bring fear into it, but it's just the truth, you know. Um, people are worried about who to trust. People are worried about whether they're being led down the wrong the wrong path. Some people are really young in all this. Some people are really, um, really, most people are really passionate in it. And sometimes we, um, we, we question to the point where we're questioning ourselves even. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I understand that. Um, yeah, I, I, absolutely. Pe people are, are, are going to have questions, but I, I just want, I want people to just know, I mean, I, I'm in this for the truth. Um, I, I just wanted to, I want to help to defeat the new world order. Uh, that's, that's what I'm all about. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I've been getting some ridiculous uh, allegations lately, but I mean, this isn't the first time for me. I, I've had a lot of crazy things happen with me. I've received death threats before. Um, you know, so it, it's not a first, but it's all part of it. Uh, you know, when, when, when you get to start doing the kind of things that I'm doing, it's all, it's all part of it. So I take it, you know, as, as it is and, uh, just, just keep trucking on. Yeah. Like I said, grain of salt and water off a duck's back, right? Yeah. And, and you know, like, like I've said before, if you want to judge me, you know, judge me by my fruits, you know, um, it, you know, yeah, that, that's basically how I'd put it. If you want to judge me, judge me by my fruits and what I've done. I'm not, uh, you know, I, people often will attack my character, which is funny. They will just call me names and, and this and that. And it's like, if you have a problem with me, you know, you know, attack the information I'm putting out. Um, but just to sit there and call me names or whatever is ridiculous. Well, you know, I've, I've, been, I've been dealing with that a little bit myself. And um, the, uh, the thing is, is that when people don't have any argument of any legitimate um, 
I, I don't, I, I, I'm not trying to put them down, but when they can't grasp the situation enough to intelligently discuss, the first thing that they do is throw out name calling. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's just, it's, it's a, it's a natural reaction, I think, for some people, um, to, in, if, well, they belittle you, right? They don't understand it, they don't agree with you, and they don't have enough information to argue it in, in an intelligent surrounding. The only thing left to do is to ridicule. Yeah, and I used to address uh, those things, and it always never, ever leads to anywhere good. Uh, it'll always just turn into an argument or whatever, and once you start engaging somebody on the Internet in a discussion like that, you're all of a sudden obliged to uh, respond to every question. And I simply just don't have time to to waste on discussing um, the, these things with people on the Internet. I mean, yeah, you know, that's that's just at, at the point where I'm at now where I'm getting a lot. I get a lot of emails. I get a lot of comments. And people people need to realize when I'm on Facebook, like I don't really use – Facebook in like I don't surf Facebook. I don't sit on there when when I use it. I go on, I post something, and then I'm off again. And then I'll go, I'll check, I'll see what people are saying every now and then. So, um, you know, I'm I'm not there constantly to uh, to to respond to to everyone. Um, but I, I I really appreciate all the comments and all the the critique and the feedback, and I learn from it all. Yeah, for constantly, sure. Constantly learning from uh, from from everyone. So. I, I can agree with that, and I thank you for saying that because I'm getting to that. I'm, I'm getting to that understanding that it's just better off to leave certain things alone. Don't feed the fire. Don't feed the beast because when you do, that just makes it grow, right? So you have to learn a point, and I think we all have to because there are so many arguments out there on the internet that um, it's just feeding the negativity and it's not serving anybody. Yeah, and I mean, you know, it's not like. Like I'll talk, I'll talk to somebody about whatever they want to talk about uh, in person. I mean, if I meet you and uh, we sit down face to face, we can we can talk about whatever you want. But my my public my public life online, I'm not necessarily going to to get into every little detail about everything. No, you have to be guarded because it seems that on Facebook and whatnot, nothing is sacred anymore. Yeah. You know, it's like personal say there's no there's no personal sacred space and that people really do jump to to infringe because um well it's a knowledge source and people are just running into that right that that's the idea now I'm just gonna do a quick um, station identification you are listening to freethinkradio.com I'm Carrie Lee this is lifting the veil and we're here with Dan Dix um from Into the Fire and uh, Press for Truth. Now, I do have a call, a question that was asked earlier. What are your thoughts on Luke Rudkowski? Sorry. Um, you know, if I, you have I, any. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm friends with Luke. I, I went down a number of times to visit him in New York. Um, he, he was supposed to be staying with me here in Toronto during the G20 Summit weekend, which... As many of you may have seen, he didn't get in. Uh, they didn't let him into the country. And that's largely because of the work that he did in Pittsburgh at the G20 Summit uh, the prior year. Um, they saw that he was a, a rather loud voice that had a rather large following, and uh, they, they stopped him from getting in here at the border. Um, but honestly, I think, I think Luke's a good guy. I think he has great intentions. And um, there's, you just can't deny the incredible accomplishments he's achieved with having, uh, you know, something like 240 We Are Change chapters all around the world, um, kind of the biggest grassroots political movement uh, that our generation certainly has seen. Um, so the guy is uh, he's inspirational to me. Um, to be honest, I, I am, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Luke Radowski. Excellent. Thanks so much. Now, um, do you have time to stick around for some calls and questions? Sure. Okay, so if anybody wants to call into the show, it's uh, join, uh, hit the call me button above the globe or call us at 315-541-4031 or add us to Skype, Freethink Radio, um, no caps, no spaces. So I've got Trev doing the back lines. How you doing, Trev? I'm doing good. Um, I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna warn the listeners now. We're gonna because we're kind of expecting a few calls. We're gonna kind of let you get in here, ask your question, and then you know remove people from the call. We're not gonna let them hang around on the call. 
Yeah, and for everybody to know, make sure you pause your player so that we don't get the background noise. And um, and then, yeah, ask your question. You'll, you'll jump off again and, and back onto the radio so you can listen to the answer because we do expect a few calls today. So, any callers? Um, Not yet, but they were calling like crazy before the show started, so I'm sure they'll be calling soon. Yeah. Um, I want to thank Dan for coming on to Freethink Radio and... Uh, and for all your work, man, I know a lot of video editing and stuff. That's that's a lot of uh, tedious, tedious work, man. People don't realize what you put into that, you know. Yeah, it sure is. Well, I'm 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 just lucky to to have um, such a great team that I work with. Um, Press for Truth is really myself and uh, Stephen Davies and Brian Law. And like I said, over the years, I've met so many people. And I, you know, when I decided to do this on my own, out of the hundreds and hundreds of people that I've worked with, I've, I've honed it in and narrowed it down to a couple of really solid guys uh, that I get along with, that I trust, and uh, who are really talented. And I think we make a good team. Um, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, blessed and lucky and honored to, to, to be working with such a great team. Uh, both those guys went to school for film, um, so it really helps out in that aspect. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, I have to say to you, uh, sorry, Trev, um, the all the whole soundtrack was done by you, correct? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you rock, dude. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I do have one question. Um, what do you see as a solution? You know, do you see it as we implement the same system with new people, or do you see it as kind of a broken car and there's no sense fixing it? we got to wipe the – we got to get a new car. You know. Yeah, that's a pretty huge um, uh, topic. I, I'm, you know, at, at this point, I'm, I'm, I'm all about global, just non-compliance. Basically, just stepping out of this system and saying no, enough is enough. And there are many things you can do to do that. There are some major steps you can do to do that. And um, I think one of the first ones, uh, which is often one of the most hardest for people to do. Um, is to get out of debt. Um, when you have a lot of debt, you know, uh, mortgages, line of credits, credit cards, uh, all these sorts of things, the, the, the system has their, their claws around your neck, and they can squeeze at any time they want. Um, so I think uh, getting out of the system and this whole global noncompliance idea, uh, step one, and like I said, it's, it's most often the hardest one is to get out of debt, and the reason why it's so hard is because people will often have to lower their standards uh, of living uh, in order to own a home outright and not owe anything to the bank. Um, but I, I think that's one of the things that people uh, should focus on um, if they're starting to figure out how do I uh, make a difference individually. And uh, I would say start with yourself, and starting with yourself uh, means get, get out of debt, you know. That's a huge one. Yeah, for sure. Well said. Excellent. You know, um, I've been to come on your guys' show uh, for a while. I've, um, you know, I've been meaning to get on uh, with Lawrence and um, uh, Slim Swayze. He's been trying to get me on for a while, and we we've just had bad timing. Uh, you know, when when he wanted to have me on, I was busy, and then when I was ready to come on, he wasn't really doing it, and then I got busy again. Um, but anyway, so I'm 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 finally here, so it's all good. It's all timing. It's all yeah. timing. But we're we're very happy to have you. We're very happy that you took some time out to uh, come on the show and uh, and and let us know what's up on your side of things. Because and and to and and to really say thank you, I, a huge thank you. Because there's not, I mean, there's only so many people that are out there doing this, right? Yeah, I mean, I I, I you know I, I appreciate that, but. Um you know, it's 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 not about me or about the group. It's about the info. Um, so, yeah, for sure. You know, yeah. Um, it, but yeah, it yeah. definitely is. Yeah. No, that's now, for sure. I, Go I got ahead. another question. Uh, see, one of the things watching into the fire that really got to me is you're watching, you know, these just masses of people, and then you're watching, you know, a hundred cops push them into a little corral and. To me, it's like, why don't we stand up for ourselves instead of cowering in the corner? You know what I mean? What, what do you think? Do you think that's the answer? Do you do you think you know being well, detained? Well, it depends on what you mean by stand up. Like, what um, what do you mean? Stand your ground. When they 
the way I look at it is there's no crime committed until there's been harm done to somebody's person or property, right? Right. right. So when they start hitting you with batons or whatever, are you not allowed to defend yourself at this point? I mean, you haven't committed a crime until that. Uh, there, there's no cr- crime committed yet. Uh, to me, it's it's never going to reach that breaking point until we stand up for ourselves and fight back. Until then, we're just going to get corralled into a little circle and thrown off into a pen again. You know what I mean? I, I don't know. I don't know where where the answer lies in that. Yeah, I hear what you're saying, and I think that there is a time and a place for everything. Um, but at you know at, at that point where people are getting kettled, uh, I mean that's just not a winnable battle. And, and trying to fight back with that is like trying to hold back the waves of the ocean. You're going to get hurt, and. Um, uh, certainly, if that needs to happen, it needs to happen before uh, a group of 30 people get surrounded by, like, 50 right. riot cops. Yeah. Yeah, it seemed, it seemed to me that there were, um, at times, more people than police. And that if they were to all stand in solidarity and even march forward, do you know what I mean? Arms linked, whatever the case may be, and pushing forward, and that's just and I like that's just me. And I'm not trying to say we'll violently run through as much as that would be hard to to deny. Wouldn't the idea of just pushing back be something? Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, remember, like the Black Bloc uh, doing what they did were a very very small small percentage of the people who were there protesting. And they ended up uh, being the ones who everybody around the world um, uh, were looking at. But it really, it really ruined the message for for a lot of those protesters mm-hmm. who had a very legitimate cause. And uh, it caused the mainstream media to it, it demonizes the protesters and the protest uh, when they see things like that. And oh, I think sure. the global elite are are looking for that clash. They they want the banks to get smashed and and this and that. They want that. They need the. Ex- Use to be able to um, to really clamp down and ramp up their efforts. But going um, away from you have to be careful. Sorry. But going away from the idea of smashing banks, just locking arms and and standing your ground. Or just out near arms wide. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, for sure. For Without sure. the violence. Um, we've been joined by a caller. Uh, caller, what's your name? Where are you from? And what do you have a question? Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, this is Christopher from. Birmingham, Alabama. Hi, Christopher. Uh, I don't know if you want to answer this, how you guys doing. I don't know if you want to answer this or not, but I was wondering if you could give us a perspective on what you think of Alex Jones and and Ron Paul as far as it being neocons or whatnot. Um, You know, I I think that um, Alex Jones has done a lot of great work. Uh, He's getting a lot of criticism uh, lately, and maybe that's because he's getting so huge and he's having such a massive uh, effect. But it, it, you can't deny that the man has uh, woken up um, millions of people, and I, I would be lying if I didn't say that he didn't inspire me. Um, you know, way, way back in the day, I used to watch his films, and, and it, it's some of the reasons why I got into doing what I'm doing. Um, so, you know, I, I, uh, I, I like Alex Jones, you know, and a lot, a lot of people are bashing him lately, and, and that's fine, and it's good to have questions and to be wary of people, and certainly you need to get your information from all kinds of sources. I mean, he, he is just a, a, a slice of the, the puzzle, a slice of the pie in the puzzle. Um, but I feel he's, he's an asset to the movement, and um, I don't think uh, what he's doing uh, is, is bad, but uh, I, I like his work personally. Well, I, I agree with you totally. I asked that question because, um, I'm doing some very unique things, and I actually drove all the way to um, Austin, Texas, to, to try to talk to him about some things we've been doing. Um, I've actually been put in jail twice uh, for what I do, and, and and wanted to advertise on his show with what we do, and never got a phone call back from him. I was able to talk to the producer. They actually called him at home. He took the phone call and said he was taking a nap. So th- those are things. I mean, he woke me up also. I mean, his films woke me up, and then now with what we do, um, can't get him to, to, to take money from us, which I found very intriguing. I'm sorry, I, I didn't catch that last part. Yeah, you broke uh, up a bit. Um, that that he wouldn't even let allow, allow us to advertise on his show, where he's always talking about you know taking money money as far as money bombs and whatnot. Um, 
can't get anybody, any of its producers, anybody to call us back now. Maybe, and this is just my thought on the situation, maybe he just has his own team investigating the situation. Um, hi, hi, Carrie from Lifting the Veil. We'd like to apologize for um, the cut that we have in this uh, interview. What ended up happening is we got a new server, and there are some bugs that need to be worked out still. I think we've gotten them all fixed. What I would like to express here is that Dan was speaking about the fact that Alex Jones inspired him. And regardless of the um, chaos that may be involved around Alex Jones now or for the past little while or whatever the case is, the fact is that without Alex coming out and doing what he does, Dan would have never been inspired to do what he does. Um, that was the main point. I can't, I, I'm not really sure what exactly happened next in the entire conversation, but this is a really good point that um, I think was important to stress is that sometimes regardless of where some of the information comes from, if it sparks inspiration for you to go farther with it, that um, you can't really sit there and um, cut it up to bits and call it all crap because if it sparked that bit of inspiration for one and has led to what is now Dan Dix impressed for truth, you can see the good in it. Once again, we apologize for the inconvenience. Um, it's not something that we will have happening for every show. Uh, thanks again. This has been Carrie Lee with Lifting the Veil. Is, uh, you know, a globalist who has uh, dreams of a new world order and all that stuff. It, it's even within organizations like that, it's a small percentage. It's it's the 20 or 30 guys who are on the steering committee uh, that you really have to be keeping an eye out for. Um, and a lot of a lot of times, a lot of the other people are kind of un, unwitting unwitting dupes, um, pawns in in the game who who are being used, and they don't see the connections in in how uh, how they relate to each other. Um, so yeah, it is it is possible for good, honest people to um, get up into high positions, and I, I I think that's a lot of the reasons why, in the earlier days, a lot of information was being leaked from Bilderberg uh, was because of people who were uh, invited to the meetings, and uh, they ended up leaking some of the info because they said I I don't like this, um, I don't like the looks of this. Um, so yeah, I mean it, it it is possible. Okay, excellent. Now. Um we missed about three minutes of the show, we think, that didn't go through. Something happened, um, apparently, with the server between. So there was a, a small lull. We apologized for any technical difficulties, and it just happened to be as we were um, chatting up about <laughs> Alex Jones and Ron Paul. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if there's any other questions out there that people have. If it isn't, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I know that you're a, a busy, a busy fella, and that you've got lots on your plate. Uh, what are your projects in the future that you're working on that you'd like to talk about? Yeah, we're, we've always got something, uh, something on the go. Um, I, I'm, I'm been working for for a while now on a documentary about Freemasonry, actually. Um, me and me and Stephen Davies have been working on it for a while now, and it kind of got put on the back burner, and we kind of uh, just left it off to the side when um, when I started working on How Do We Fall, and then I mean uh, the G20 summit came right before we released United We Fall, so I ended up going right into making uh, Into the Fire after that. Uh, but now that all that is said and done. We're, we're going to get back into um, this little project that we've been working on for a little while, which is uh, probably a short documentary on uh, on Freemasonry, which is not an easy task because it's such a huge topic. Um, right. That, um, amongst many other things, uh, that's one of them. I got a question since you brought it up. Um, what's your thoughts on you know Freemasons within the movement? Uh, yeah, that's a bit of a what do they call it? An oxymoron. Um, <laughs> I, I don't understand how somebody uh, who who has a concept or a grasp of of how this thing works could could be a part of of, uh, of something like that unless they've uh, unless they've been deceived in some sort of way. Um, obviously, you know the pe name that comes to mind is the the Fitzgerald from um, New York there in in the Change chapter who's who's a Freemason and. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it just doesn't make sense to me. Um, you know, it, obviously he, he uh, has a lot of learning to do about, uh, about how this system works, and he needs to be careful about the people he aligns himself with. Right. You pretty much, you know, nailed my feelings on the subject. Yeah. For the most part. You know, I, I've been in this a little, for a, well, not a long time, but a good while. And, and my, one of my, the first things I learned was that was the enemy. You know what I mean? Like, that, right. that's kind of what we were fighting against. And then I've seen so much of this, you know, and it's not just crackers. You know, Ron Paul is supposedly a Mason, or at least he's very surrounded by Masons. And, yeah. And you, know, you would think that some some red flags would it go off in in your mind at some point with all the secrecy, with the uh, you know the, the rituals and um, you know the you know you would think that as a truther some red flags would be going off and and you would think hey this this seems like uh, very similar to the kind of kind of people that I'm trying to expose here. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Without without doubt that there's there's those infiltrators more or less that are uh, causing waves and then making people not be able to trust the things that they've been trusting all along. It's yeah. all part of the game. Yeah. Unfortunately, um, and and it is it's sad and in, in in a time where we're not trusting so much, the last thing that we need is to have these kinds of things. But, you know, it's a test of our character. It's a, it's, it's a test of our spirit. It's a test of our gut instincts. We have to listen to those. We have to, you know, really open our eyes and see everything, the forest for the trees, as far as I'm concerned, and uh, be able to discern for ourselves and to stop being led and to start leading ourselves to some extent because there's always going to be some kind of uh, provocateur um that's going to be in the way trying to rustle, ruffle feathers and to make nobody trust anybody. And that's the point. We have to trust each other. Yeah. Um, just, just speaking about provocateurs, I mean, I, I, I want to address some, something that I get asked a lot and um, is probably a question that people are, are wondering about um, because I get asked it all the time. So I might as well talk about it here and now, which is um, – my views on whether or not there were agent provocateurs embedded in the black block at the G20. Now, people who uh, may have seen uh, our film, The Nation's Deathbed, you'll see how we documented in the, in the uh, protest in Montebello, Quebec, how those three police officers were caught red-handed being agent provocateurs trying to incite violence. Um, even when they were called out about it, about The Rock, they said, oh, The Rock was just part of the costume. Um, but it was clearly uh, trying to provoke other people uh, to get into that. So our guard was up, um, and rightly so, because the Canadian government's been caught doing it before. So we we were being ever uh, vigilant and constantly keeping an eye out, and I always will keep an eye out for something like that in these situations. Now, having said that... Um, you know, we've gone through hundreds and, you know, hundreds of hours of, of footage. And I haven't necessarily seen any kind of a smoking gun type of evidence that would definitively say that one of those guys was a police officer. There are some things that were very questionable that we included uh, in the film, like the guys in black running behind uh, police lines. Um, but that's not necessarily definitive proof. Um, but it's not to say that um, it did or didn't happen. It may have happened. Um, all I'm trying to say is I haven't actually seen any definitive smoking gun type of footage um, that would suggest that. But we, unfortunately, we have to be uh, ever vigilant of it because it has happened before. And, um, you know, it's, it's very safe to say that it could and, and still may happen again. Yes, for sure. And, like, I mean, honestly, when I watched that part where you, you see, you know, the black block run behind police, well, it looked like he was invited or she yeah. was invited. It looked like, I mean, it, it's very hard for me to sit back and say uh, that that it wasn't, I mean, it maybe it might have just been a slip or whatever the case is, but it looks very, very, um, it makes me feel uneasy anyway. When I saw it, I was like, wait a minute. Yeah, and when you see in, in their track record that this is often a, a tactic that um, police agencies and governments use, 
Um, it's it's really not a stretch of the imagination to think that it may have happened here in Toronto. And that's why we were constantly on the lookout for it. Uh, that's why I questioned the, the head of the SIU there about it. I know, I saw that. Yeah, I mean, we, we had to, uh, we, we, we were on the lookout for that. So, um, yeah, sorry, I just got a phone call. I'm sorry, I just got to turn my phone off. Oh, that's okay. You know, the idea, too, is that maybe because you were out there and they were aware of your presence that they had to back off a bit. There is a great possibility of that. Right. I mean, it's possible. I, I couldn't believe the answer that that guy gave me when I said, can you assure to me that you will not use agent provocateurs? And he literally just said, you know, I am not at liberty to discuss security <laughs> issues in an open format. You might as well have just said, yep, we're going to do it. Yeah, yeah, you know, so, um, so, so again, um, the idea that they do these sorts of things, it's, it's true. They do do these sorts of things. And we do need to, uh, continue to keep, keep our eye out for it and recognize that it's a, it's a tactic, um, that constantly, um, goes on. Um, so that's why we included, uh, that in the intro in, in the film and also that questionable scene, um, with the black block running behind the line. Yeah, for sure. Now, did you happen to hear about, um, I had heard a story, I think it was in our local paper, um, but I'm not going to quote it because I'm not exactly sure. There was apparently a girl that had diabetes that was stuck in one of the cages during the G20, and they didn't do anything to get her her insulin. They were, I don't know if anybody knows what the eating conditions were like there, but it was a um, piece of processed cheese on two pieces of white bleach bread and water, I think, is the major- most of what they got. And this one girl went for like 24 to 48 hours without her insulin, from what I understand. Did you get any stories like that that came out to you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, uh, I heard about that. Uh, there was another uh, elderly gentleman who had the exact same situation going on. And, um, you know, people were screaming to them at the bus, on the bus that they were holding, that this guy needs his insulin, he needs his insulin. Um, but they just wouldn't, they just wouldn't listen. And I, uh, I was supposed to interview him for the film, and it ended up uh, not, not working out. Um, but yeah, that, those are one of the many, uh, many, many stories that I've heard that didn't, didn't actually end up making it into the film. That's the thing, uh, so many unbelievable things happened. And we really had to keep it. I mean, you got to keep it within two hours. Uh, it, it, that's just that's just how it is. People don't are not willing to sit down and watch something that's you know a whole lot longer than that. Uh, so we did our best to include all the important things. But yeah, there was a lot of things like that that uh, that that surprised me and and just didn't really make it into the film. But that's why we included a lot of. Um, special features and even in the special features there was tons of special features that we couldn't include just because it wouldn't fit on the disc um so there's so many so many things uh, that happened um but um yeah but the, the special features on the disc have a lot of uh little little things that um that that we've never put out and that that you'll get to see uh if if you want to get the dvd and we do we we really do need people's support i mean we we're working hard to put this this work out there, and and that's why we we do go all out on the DVDs. We try to make them um, as as good as we can. Um, so really, if if you're listening and you like our work, you want to show your support, you like what we do. Um, the best way to do that is to get a DVD, and of course, you know, we make sure that they didn't have the copyright protect on it. That way, people can uh, burn as many copies as they want. And, and give them out to, to anybody they want to, and uh, we f- fully encourage that. Uh, but we do need people to know that we, uh, we need their support um, if they want to see us continue to do this work. Well, I'm going to say this <laughs> live. I don't know if I've said this live before, but I, um, I made copies, and I went up and down the couple streets around me. Like I said, very small town. I made about 100 copies, and I dropped them off in uh, mailboxes. Awesome. That's, you that's know, any little bit. Too. Yeah, yeah, that's that's great. That's uh, and you know that's 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 um, potentially planting uh, truth seeds. I mean, who knows what who you may have woken up. You 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 may have you may have very well um, planted a seed that is going to grow into this awesome awesome thing that somebody is going to get inspired and get involved in the movement and become a leader and make some massive changes. Um, so, you know, all those kind of things are so important to do, and uh, good on you for that. 
Well, that's the thought process behind it, though, right? Because, I mean, you can't, you can't just talk to people, right? But if somebody gets a free DVD in the mail and they have no idea, like, I mean, I put a little label on it, um, into the fire, the Canadian G20 story is what I put on it. <laughs> and I went in, you know, here I am, middle of the night, passing these out. And uh, obviously, I want to do it inconspicuously because, and, and maybe this is just me, I still want to be able to walk around the city without everybody pointing and whispering at this point. Um, I, I go, I frequent the farmer's market, um, I, you know, I, and I love to talk to people, so I don't really want that X of, you know, uh, of shame on my back by any means. But at the same time, I, I want people to know what's going on. Um, I think I'm going to have to get over that issue that I'm having at some point because, you know, here I am on the radio doing my thing. Um, but at that time when I first did what, like what I'm telling you about, I just wasn't comfortable enough with it. And I wanted to do it kind of like a <laughs> ninja. Ah, truth by stealth. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, that, that's a, that's a great thing to do. I, I used to do that all the time. Mailboxes, uh, parking lots. A fun one that I, I like to do is leaving it in, you know, a DVD in, say, a, a waitress's uh, bar tab thing. You know, you get your, you get, you get your bill and you slip a disc in, into the into the thing. I used to do that all the time. Um, it's just, uh, you know, they get their tip and they get a nice little movie with it too. So a tip sure. and, a, and a really good tip to go along with it, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, definitely. That's fantastic. Well, guys, I'm gonna give you another five minutes for call-ins. And then we're going to let Dan go. Um, again, you're listening to freethinkradio.com. It's lifting the veil. We're talking with um, Dan Dix from Press for Truth and Into the Fire. Um, Dan, it's been an absolute pleasure. I am so glad that you decided to come on the show. We're going to be, uh, I'll send you the link for the restream for it. Um, it's been a pleasure talking with you, I have to say. Oh, you too. And um, keep keep it up. Keep doing what you're doing, because um, because your work is is ex- extremely important. And um, the the station is growing, and uh, people are listening. Um, so really, keep 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 up the good work. Thank you. We appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. All right. We're gonna let you go. So you you take care and keep fighting the good fight. And we're right there with you. Okay. Okay. Thanks, guys. Take care. See ya. Take care. Thank you for joining us, man. It's no pleasure. problem. All right. Um, and that being said, I, I don't know, Trev, if you've had, got anything to say. I'm uh, sorry again for the three to five minutes there that uh, we had no sound. Um, it's uh, it's one of those things yeah, that happens. Yeah, I apologize. Guys, we just, uh, as you know, we've been fundraising for a new server, and uh, we had a donation from CFR that was, you know, Great, big ups to him for that. That made it possible to get the new server. So uh, there's going to be a few kinks here and there where we work out this new server situation out. But uh, all in all, uh, the sound's coming out clear. It's been running fairly smoothly, so I'm happy. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I, I guess that's uh, that's about it. Um, we're going to sign off now. Uh, I'll give you a rundown um, of the shows. We've got 4 p.m., uh, late with Kate. Is Kate on this week, or is she off because of? Um, no, she's uh, she's got she just moved. Hi again, it's Carrie Lee. And in this part, we were just explaining that uh, Kate had moved, and um, she's going to be without internet service for a bit. Uh, there's a possibility of it being around three weeks, uh, probably less. We don't know exactly, but there'll be restream going on. I went through the lineup. Um, I'll go through it again for you guys. As you know, it's late with Kate at 4. 5 p.m. is an open slot, and we encourage uh, people to come in and try out for that. If you've got something to say, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Um, try a show. I've done it. It's pretty cool. I'm enjoying it. And, uh, and yeah, it's good times. All right, 6 o'clock, you've got Pete and Pepe. At 7 p.m., you have Trevor and Nelson with uh, the True North show. We have um, 8 p.m. Awaken United, Chris Freedom Flowers, uh, Fridays with my husband John as a co-host. 9 p.m. is Blings with the UFO Hour. At 10, we have Harry Link and Death to the New World Order. And uh, then 11 o'clock is your show. Again, I would really like to thank 
uh, Dan Dix for coming on from Press for Truth and doing this interview today. It was an absolute pleasure, and we look forward to speaking to him again in the near future. Until then, keep lifting the veil.